just so um, it can be used for wonderful purposes. It can supply power, it can provide accurate medical images, it can even treat cancer. However, it can also be used to create the most destructive weapons man has ever made. So like it or not, generative AI is here to stay. And so it's important for us as teachers, as students, researchers, and professionals to think about how we can use it effectively and efficiently and ethically. This way we can maximize the good aspects of the technology and minimize the bad. So this panel is a collection of engineers with a wide background of experience in teaching and professional practice and in research. Our goal, my goal, is to create a stimulating discussion between us and us in the audience um, and talk about sort of three main areas, um, at generative AI and research, in teaching and learning, and in professional practice. So the structure is going to be as follows. I'm going to divide up the time equally between those three areas. I'll ask a question or two of the panel, have them respond, and then we'll open it up to the audience to have you know, as many questions as you want. If there are no questions, I have questions for days. So let's get started. Quick, some quick intros. So first we have Dr. Dave Burkhart. Dr. Dave Burkhart is a professor of engineering and the founder and co-director of the Center for STEM Research. Dr. Burkhart has dedicated his career to integrating evidence-backed teaching strategies and STEM education into classrooms at all age ranges. Over the last 25 years, Dr. Burkhart has won over $35 million in uh, NSF funding for STEM education research uh, through his work at the Center for STEM Research. Dr. Burkhart was awarded the 2011 ITEEA Award for Distinction, Scholarship, and Research for his work advancing student learning. To his right, we have Dr. Eddie Curry. Dr. Eddie Curry is an Associate Professor of Engineering. He has a long history as a pioneer in the personal computer and embedded systems industries, from serving as co-founder of PC Magazine to and general manager for the first uh, personal computer company, MITS. To, uh, okay. Dr. Curry has been in executive positions at companies like ImageSoft, Tritium Technology Inc., and Intersoft. Dr. Curry uses his extensive knowledge in new business development to teach entrepreneurship to engineering and computer science students. Then we have Dr. Brian Golly. Uh, Dr. Golly is an assistant professor of engineering and the graduate director of the Engineering Management Magister's degree program. Dr. Golly has over a decade of experience in applying project management and industry industrial engineering to manufacturing, healthcare, and other industries. Dr. Golly has authored over 100 papers in the field of industrial engineering and is the co-editor-in-chief for both the Industrial Journal of Social Technology and Knowledge Development and the International Journey of Project Management and Productivity Assessment. And then finally, on the far right, we have Dr. Nick Myrna. Uh, Dr. Myrna is an Associate Professor of Engineering. He was awarded Hofstra's Researcher of the Year Award in 2023 for his research developing plant-based extracellular matrix scaffolds for vascular reconstruction. Dr. Myrna also received an NIH Academic Research Enhancement Award to help expose undergrad students to research. As part of that effort, over the last six years or so, Dr. Myrna has mentored 21 undergraduate students in his research group, several of which have co-authored papers before graduating from Hofstra. So that is our audience, and I think to begin, I'd like to ask you all to answer this one question. How do you currently engage with generative AI? So someone want to take it off? Nick? Sure. So I do use ChatGTP and other models. Um, for a number of areas of my research. Um, I'm always looking for opportunities to try to save time or do something more efficiently or more effectively. So for example, I might use ChatGPT to brainstorm ideas, new ideas for projects, new projects. Um, I might develop timelines or research plans for my students for uh, over the summer, for example. Um, I came up with a structure for a six week program where I was working with high school students on one-on-one -on -one mentored research. And recently I uh, had used um, ChatGPT to work on a um, schedule for a uh, internship program I'm doing for uh, undergraduate students participating in bioengineering research. Um, I also like to use ChatGPT to help me in the literature review process to learn more about new fields that I'm not familiar with. Um, and I would say that that summarizes the main areas where I've, I've been using it. Um, I've used ChatGPT uh, in my undergraduate and graduate classes in project management to generate project schedules, to generate risk assessments, and generate um, case studies 
for students to use as examples to evaluate projects and see where there are some of the pitfalls as well as successes for students to then, you know, essentially correct it and say, what would they do instead if they were the project manager? And I'm starting to use it a little bit more similar to Nicholas here um, on the research side to look at literature review to see like what's new out there and to help build a case for where there's gaps in research. Uh, I've been using uh, ChatGP for a number of things. Uh, one of which is I do a lot of writing uh, where I use the language LaTeX to actually format the programs that I'm using. And I use uh, ChatGPT to actually create the LaTeX code for me so that I don't have to do that, uh, which I find very useful. Uh, I also use it uh, for just for general information gathering. I use it uh, as, a, as an aid in teaching the video gaming class um, because it, it does a lot of uh, work, good work on writing scripts and so forth for uh, examples for students. I have a much broader interest in uh, neural network technology because uh, recently we just got a grant that will allow us to actually do some serious uh, neural network development here, which had, in my case, is related directly to um, a system that we're developing to do uh, autonomous wound closure, which is the first phase of a fairly lengthy program to actually do uh, medical diagnostics uh, intradominally, uh, not just externally. Um, and I have another, a number of other uses as well. I don't think right now that it's... Um, a tool that uh, I fully appreciate. I'm having to learn what it's good at and what it's not good at, and some things it's very good at and some things it's horrible at. Uh, but I'm in the learning process. And I've also come to the conclusion that we have to teach students how to use this tool uh, because we've got to teach them how to ask the right questions, how to formulate their questions in a way in which the results will be more meaningful. And actually, um, I teach a course it's technology and society in which students write essays and give presentations throughout the semester on various topics, perhaps on bioengineering, perhaps on robots, perhaps on automation in society, different aspects of society. So what I've done is that we, the students have to use ChatGPT or BARD to write the essay. So they have to frame the question. I sort of frame the question. Then, then they have to make it theirs. And here's where, and if there's students in the class in attendance, they can talk about this. So here's where their trouble is. So I told them, we are an experiment, they and I. And so I said, you have to use this. Then you have to make it your own. We're going to put it in Word, use Word, track changes, use comments, verify the references that are there. Make sure that what's being said is accurate and what you want to be said. And so we're working on that. I, I have found a couple of things that I'll talk about perhaps a little bit later, just in terms of findings, but it's unique there. Anyway, there are challenges because mostly uh, students have told me they can't use it in their classes. And I, I developed this because I talked to students who graduated working in industry and it is being used. I have a daughter who's an attorney. She uses it. I don't know how the Dickens she uses it. There's a language upgrade right. for you, Eddie. Thank and you very so, much. Uh, yeah, I figured you'd like that. And then, uh, so, uh, but it is going to be used. And what I wanted the students to come away with is the ability to use it effectively going forward after this course. All right. Thank you, everyone. I think we're going to start with our first topic, uh, research. Uh, and so uh, what research tasks have you found AI to be particularly helpful or unhelpful for? Are there any key challenges and limitations of using generative AI that researchers should be aware of? So I could start and uh, go over literature reviews and my experience with that. So traditionally, I like to spend a lot of time on literature reviews. I go through something like PubMed or Google Scholar, and I go through hundreds of papers and I read reviews, uh, original articles, and I find very useful information there. And it's, it's current, it's recent, it's peer reviewed. Um, and that, that has done well for me. So with ChatGPT, what I was hoping was to see if it could save time um, and hopefully produce information that's still accurate. Um, and when I 
tried looking into new areas and doing literature reviews on new areas, I found that it could summarize large bodies of information very quickly, and I could learn new things a little faster. But when I actually checked the facts and compared it to what's out there, I noticed there were inaccuracies in the information and there were mistakes. So I had to be cautious when, uh, whenever I performed any review of new information using ChatGPT. Um, I noticed I had a hard time finding accurate references for things that ChatGPT gave me, and I consider references extremely valuable during the uh, review process. So I'm, I'm hoping that in the future that um, they uh, add more functionality to allow for uh, references. Um, and another area besides literature review is I talked about schedules. So I think having some structure to a training plan and a, a project uh, is very valuable for uh, research projects and for grant proposals. Um, it's something I have some experience doing, but I always like to get fresh ideas uh, in terms of timelines and content to include in a structured training plan. So I found uh, ChatGPT was a helpful partner to kind of work with and bounce ideas off to generate new interesting ideas for a training plan that I would otherwise not have come up with. So those two things I would point out. My main area has been literature review, and I find it's kind of a mixed bag. It really depends on the question and, and the keywords that you're asking ChatGPT to look for. Um, I found that it's good at, you know, similar to what Nick said, you know, summarizing information. But when it comes to looking at exact references and even getting relevant um, information, it comes down to like asking the right key question and looking at like, you know, the, the right key words for asking it to bring back that relevant information to you. All right. So uh, second question. So large language models like, uh, oh, you want it? I mean, you guys don't have to answer every question if you want. Oh, that's okay. Continue. All right. So uh, large language models like ChatGPT produce uh, the most statistically likely information given their training data. And so is there a risk of biasing your thinking towards dominant methodologies and perspectives by using generative AI? Well, there's no question there's a risk. It's a statistical system, which means it's not always right. So there's, there can be a very significant risk. It depends on the context. I mean, one of the problems with, with uh, transformer technology right now is that there's no context understanding. So we're doing queries on data that's been kind of mixed up. We don't have the sources, and uh, we, we always have to question the results. But no matter what the response is, it has no awareness of context. And so information without context is not terribly exciting uh, for a lot of qu uh, queries that you'd want to make. And uh, so I think I think AI as such is kind of a misnomer. Uh, I, I guess we could argue about the meaning of intelligence uh, or knowledge, but I don't think something is AI until it really does pass, the at a minimum, the Turing test, which is a very poor criteria for deciding whether or not something's truly intelligent. But I don't think we're even close to artificial intelligence at this point. What we have is a tool that's very exciting to use. We've never seen anything like it before. It does some really interesting things, but it has some serious issues. And I think we have to keep that in mind. And I think a lot of the hype that you hear about threats of AI and so forth, a lot of it is people trying to get attention because they want to raise money. They want to be on YouTube. They want to be interviewed by Fox News. Uh, but I think once we get into it, we'll find out that the threat is not as great as people claim, and we're a long way from AI. And as Chomsky keeps pointing out, this, this technology has little or nothing to do with the way the brain actually operates. Uh, and so the, the human brain is undoubtedly a lot more complicated than, than transformers and the existing technology. And so one of the things I learned, Eddie, and you will know more about this because he knows everything, uh, and at least in my narrow world. You know, I can even get abused at home. I don't have to come here to get abused. <laughs> well, I'll... this is your home. Okay. That's uh, true. Yeah. You've noticed. <laughs> just my just remember, don't use big words that I don't understand. Okay. Uh, probabilistic. So one of the things I looked at with AI was that it was a probabilistic model. And so it was looking at billions of probabilities. So when I... When I looked at this just to see how it worked, but you alluded, you didn't allude to this, you said this. So it's a probabilistic model that's looking at what the next word might be based on the probabilities, right. which is different than the intelligence that's right. formed from a knowledge base. So I think there's a challenge associated with that. And perhaps someone 
uh, would speak to how this might be how this might be influenced because they they did a crawl across the web to get information. That was part of it. The Wikipedia was used. Reddit was used. Why you use Reddit? I have no idea. But could misinformation be part of what? Oh, it is. That's oh. the problem. That's the problem. It's so, a polluted. It's a polluted. The value I think of the of the technology, in part, is is let's have some curated databases, things that we think are reliable, things the kind of things that are going on in the law school where they have lots of cases that they they can analyze, and summarize, um, where, where you have databases that that are known to be of quality, uh, and don't go out into the web and get. Who knows what kind of opinion? And, and you do, the other problem is you don't know what weighting the network, the uh, neural network is given to the bad information. So it's it, it reminds me of OCR. When OCR came out, we were told, oh, this is great because it gets 90% of the, of the uh, characters so correctly. OCR. Yeah, optical character for audience members or moderators who don't know what that means. Optical character recognition. So if I had if I had some PDF document and I wanted to convert it to a Word file, I could just scan it and they would read it. But then once you start using it, you realize that means that every ten character ten characters out of every hundred may not be correct. So now you have to go back and correct it. So it took a while to to come to terms with that. I think the same thing's true of of uh, chatbot, the, this kind of technology. We have to learn how to use it. Okay, so in that manner, um, how do we use it? How do we ensure accuracy and relevance of AI-generated results when given its tendency to produce inaccurate information? How do you use this as a tool given it might lie to you or confidently produce information that's Well, at minimum, you start with a training set, a quality, what allegedly is a quality training set. Okay. Do you have any thoughts, uh, Dr. God? I would also say that it uh, starts with the inputs. What's going into the, chat, you know, into the AI you know, if we have biasing into the historical data, it's going to reflect in the model that's going to re produce results. So, if it, you know, if there's historical bias from that data and you rely on that data to generate output, the input's going to, if it's garbage input, it's going to create garbage output. So I think that we really have to reflect on the inputs that go into it, like the sources, the databases that they rely on, like whether it's Reddit right. or Wikipedia. There's another problem, too, and that is that if you think about it, most of the world's knowledge is not written down anywhere. So the idea that you're going to you're going to end up with a system that understands everything about everything is a little naive to say the least. And secondly, if you're going to rely on the web, you really do have a highly contaminated database to work with. But I think in our case, for example, we want to scan uh, for initially what we're going to use the technology for is to be able to, to scan uh, wounds and have an AI system explain to us the type of wound, the condition of the wound, are there bleeders present? Is there detritus in the wound? Uh, the extent of the wound? What's the recommend some techniques for closing the wound or tr otherwise treating it? Uh, and also to monitor the, the operation and status of the system that's doing this because the system we're developing is a totally autonomous uh, system for doing robotic surgery. Um, and we want, we've got to be very careful that we don't injure somebody in the process. So there's a lot, a lot to be taken into account. But we will have uh, qualified imagery to work with. We'll know where it came from. We'll know something about the nature of the wounds. Um, and we'll have some control over it. But I wouldn't go to the web and start looking for, for wounds uh, for imagery. We, we're going to get those through other sources. We can get them through NIH and other places. So it's it's all about the quality of the, of the training set. Uh, your thoughts, Dr. Murrow? Yeah, so uh, related to a couple of things you all said, one very specific example of bias in data is that over the past few decades, there's been a wealth of information available uh, when designing biomedical devices specific to males. Um, so for someone looking on the web or using ChatGPT, that's what they're going to find, information about how to design a biomedical device for a male. Um, so one way you can tailor your, your prompt, your prompt engineering, would be to realize that potential bias and try to find a more encompassing answer that looks for, you know, more specific cases where data had been collected for females. Um, so what we can do as educators is try to teach our students of the potential fit pitfalls here and how we can um, properly prompt ChatGPT for uh, better answers that aren't biased towards the wealth of uh, information out there. All right. I think at this point... 
I have one little. I was just I was just conferring with he who knows most, and uh, I know I'm embarrassed. I'll stop perhaps. Uh, I thought we were friends. <laughs> well, I've been dis. I know disabused well, of that. So, uh, but uh, GPT four doesn't constantly update. So that's what I was checking with uh, Eddie about. And so whatever was there in 2022, 2022, that was the information. It was a, I read somewhere in The Economist, it's like $100 million to get this information. And so they're not doing it on an ongoing basis. So the biases that Nick talked about, and Brian talked about, that are in the data set in 2022 will be there in 2024, and certainly now in 2023. And also, there are other biases. I mean, in the course of training, uh, sometimes they have humans that interact with the, with the responses from the system, and says, "Well, no, that's not correct." So there's an opportunity to instill biases just from the fact that we still have humans involved. I think at this point, I'm going to open up for questions. Are there any audience questions? If not, I'll keep going on to some other questions. All right, so if you have a question, just come up to the mic at any time. So yeah, if you want to just come up to the mic right there, um, and we can, because we want to make sure that the people on the internet can hear this, so. I just have a question as educators, using this student uh, as a faculty member, students get assignments for discussion boards, term papers, all the way up to thesis, and they utilize chat GPT and, and instill that in their assignment. Is that plagiarism? Is that, is that something that's a, that, that requires discipline as it would if you, if you copied a paper or took something from a fraternity file that was 10 years old and used that? You know, are, are there guidelines developed about that? And, and um, is it sustainable if, if it's challenged and you do penalize a student? I think that actually that was a good problem, and I think it actually comes into research as well because plagiarism isn't just a problem when you're a student teaching. Plagiarism is really big for academic integrity. So as researchers, if you're using AI, is that plagiarism? If you're using generative AI to help write a proposal or a paper, so I have a different. I have a tendency to have orthogonal views of things, but I don't think plagiarism is a substantive issue. I think it's an issue for certain people. If, if what you're doing is taking copyrighted material and replicating it exactly, that's a form of plagiarism. But if you think about the web, the web is full of all kinds of information and has been for a long time, which is drawn from a lot of different sources. And you take that information and now you give it to a neural network for this training and it further mixes this up. Now the issue is, how, to what extent are we going to allow people to own ideas? And this is analogous to what happened in the software industry uh, at one point, you could not patent uh, software. Then the patent office got this brilliant idea that you should patent software. And I went to a patent uh, hearing in, in D.C. And Microsoft was there, Oracle was there, all the big software companies were there. And they all agreed that patenting software was a terrible idea. And I said, well, why are you here? And they said, because people are getting patents on software. So we have to patent stuff so that we have something to trade with. So if Microsoft wants to use something that Apple has, they have to have a patent they can present and say, well, we'll let you use our patent in return. Uh, subsequently, the patent office decided that, well, the, the right thing to do was always require that if it's going to be patented, it has to be part of a hardware system. The reason I would object to software patenting is that you don't want people in an evolving industry uh, laying claim to optimal ways of doing things. And if you want to, if you want to allow them to get proprietary rights to something, that's one thing. But just to, in general, to say that, well, you didn't say exactly what I said, but I was the first person to say it, and therefore I own it. I think is ridiculous. But anyway, I don't see as a practical matter that there are going to be there are people right now that are suing, alleging plagiarism for for images and for, in some cases text. I don't see that going very far. Um, and at least I hope it doesn't go very far, because I don't think it's in the interest of anybody. I think knowledge should be generally available. I think we have patents to pay people for their creativity, but even those patents have a duration, as does copyright, except for Mickey Mouse and Coca-Cola, I guess. Uh, but I think, you know, we're in, a, we're in a, an environment in which ideas are what we deal with. This is how we exist, is well, by, with if ideas. I, if I can so. interrupt. 
you're looking for students to develop skills. We have, uh, we have academic platforms like Blackboard and Canvas that have plagiarism detectors, and now they have chat GPT okay. um, uh, you know, uh, detectors. Yeah. If that information is found to be that, how do you react as, as somebody? So, so I, I see what your question is. And so since it's a probabilistic, so the question is, did the, let's take a student in the class because I'm doing this. So the, I figured your question was more directed to me. Uh, so I like this software thing. So, you know, there he's, he's going to do it again. Uh, and so the information is, isn't initially created by the student. It's created by a probabilistic model that is not copying anything. If you put the same question in again, you'll get a different response. And so a different probability. If I change a word, as Elliot said, if I change a word, it comes out differently. So... It isn't initially generated by the student. It isn't copied from something that someone wrote. So that's play. If, if I copied your paper and said it was mine, that would be plagiarism. And there, it isn't footnoted. Now they do bogus. Well, I won't say always, but often, as Brian and Nick have, I believe, attested, the the references themselves, when you have text, are you have to be skeptical of. But what I do believe helps students is they have to investigate it, looking at real resources, develop enough of a knowledge base so that what is finally done, the, the chat one or the bard one has been modified so it is theirs, and that then becomes their creation. Well, what if they don't? They get a zero. But that's what I'm saying. Is that sustainable? To you know, against you know, uh, against uh, you know, a, a an appeal, so to speak. I don't know what the appeal is. I think one of the problems that you have to note is that the um, generative AI detectors are not very good. Um, Chat GB, uh, OpenAI themselves has a Chat GPT detector, and they have since said that it is not effective and that it comes up with more false positives than anything else. So I would just caution against using those detectors because often. When you use it, it might be saying a student's plagiarized when they're not, um, which is cliches are a thing, right? People write very similarly for a reason. Um, so just just to be careful about that. Thank you. Yeah, and adding on to that, I've seen software where it goes both ways. Um, you can write an authentic paper. It's perfectly fine. And the detector flags it as 100% AI generated. But something that is AI generated can be adjusted. There's parameters you can adjust like perplexity to fool the system and it thinks it's 100% authentic because you're introducing man-made errors. So that's why I'm hesitant to rely on those kind of softwares to tell me if something was generated by AI um, that a student gave me. All right, I think probably one last question for this section. And so um, guidelines by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors state that generative AI should not be listed as an author. Um, quote, because they cannot be responsible for the accuracy, integrity, and originality of the work, and the responsibilities are required, and those responsibilities are required for authorship. Do you think this is the correct approach, and how should generative AI be acknowledged in research work? I think it would be, I think it's desirable to know if, if you have relied on generative AI in order to produce a paper. Um, it is going to go through a review process assuming that they are peer-reviewed uh, papers. Um, but it would, it would be nice to know that that happened. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how important it is, ultimately. Uh, the author is responsible for the content. If it's going to be peer-reviewed, if the reviewers don't catch the fact that it's not a substantive paper, I don't know what you do. I don't know. Actually, I do have an example of that that I'm not asking a question. But uh, recently, last month, there was an article that... Uh, in the Physica script that got published and through peer review that then got retracted because it was pointed out that the paper contained the phase, phrase regenerate response. And so they had just used ChatGPT and copied it directly into their paper. So, you know, peer review, you know, peer review is a good thing, but sometimes it misses stuff. I did see a case the other day where uh, ChatGPT, I asked it for a list of references and it came back and said, well, here are five references, but two of them are made up because I couldn't find more than you know, three. So you have that kind of stuff going on, but at least it, it confessed that it had done that. Which <laughs> I... <laughs> All 
All right, I think with that, we'll move on to the next section, which is teaching. And so this is about us as teachers and students as learners. So I want to start, start off with uh, Dr. Bert Hart. Uh, what is your experience with your, your uh, experiment bringing uh, AI into the classroom? What so I, are there any students in the class here? Yes, we are. I can't, I can't see that far. <laughs> but, so what, what, I, what I would like to do is pose things from uh, my perspective and then have you uh, respond from your perspective on how this works. So this started last semester uh, because I often ask students what I should be doing in the future. So what I do is just say, what should I be doing next? And obviously in the spring, I used the GPT-0 to check things. I used whatever they had with turnitin.com. So anyway, I checked it. Uh, with, and I couldn't interpret the results sometimes, particularly if it's all the way one way, then it's easy. But where it's in the middle, I have no idea what to do. So I didn't do anything. Um, and so, well, if you don't know what to do, doing nothing is it, muddled along. And so, but I had people who worked in industry and were working in industry feel that this was a skill that they thought that engineers that, that certainly they would need in their profession going forward. And so I thought, well, here's a chance for us to learn how to do it, for me to present it. Now, I created a model for it, which has been modified. And so the, the model that I created was that I did electrification of New York City in the early 1900s. So that was my question that I, whoop, that I asked the chat to do. And it came back with an essay. And then I modified the essay using track changes, I checked the references. I looked up references to see what was accurate and what was not, and then rewrote the paper with comments as to why I did what I did and how I did it. Uh, that became a little cumbersome, so that I asked the students to give the original version and their final edited version. And so we're, we're now, that was the first iteration. Now we're on the second iteration where I want them to do that and then make the comments and verify the uh, references. What I found is that there's, not for all students, but for some students, there's a reliance on what was created and they didn't really check the references because these are all assignments that I've known and I've done them before. So I have some knowledge base about what they are. And so it doesn't have the depth of thought that the students had when they did the original research themselves. So I see that as a challenge. But that's from my perspective. And now I have someone who could have a student perspective. So if, if you might provide that, that would be wonderful. Whoever said yes, you're in the class. Because I can't say. I said yes. You, you said yes, you're in the class, Gertie. You're not in the damn class. <laughs> And you're not a student. I don't know how this happened. It's why when I was chair of CS, I always had these problems. I didn't know what was happening. So so what you're saying is that these students generally didn't engage with the assignment. They kind of were like, oh, look, it's an essay. And they were happy with that. They're, so there were mixed reviews. So what I have to do is some students were excellent. Some students were not as good. So I had a scale. And so it had perhaps had to do with the maturity of the students. So some students were juniors and seniors, and they had more maturity than people who were freshmen and sophomores. So I have that issue that I am dealing with, and I, I don't know who's what. I can guess, but I don't know who's what. So, but I need, so I'm constantly, so I refer to what they've done, and then we try, I try to make the, the course so that they do what, I hope they will do, and not be Stephen Schwartz, the attorney, the infamous attorney. Uh, you're talking about the one who got the, the fines? Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my questions later, so thanks. Okay. Anyways, right. so. I struggled that. <laughs> so in, uh, in May, Chegg's stock price dropped 49% in one day after the company said that students were turning to chat GPT to learn. So is it possible for students to learn from generative AI using it as a tutor? Do you guys think so? Were they turning to check to learn, or were they turning to get the answers? Uh, no comment. So, <laughs> if 
but you know, can I don't they? Think, I don't think there's any question. The question that ChatGP is is a, a good learning tool. I don't think there's any question about that. The question is the quality of the results it produces. But in terms of giving people inspiration, uh, I think Nick was saying that uh, he uses it sometimes just to get an idea on how to get started on something. I've had the same experience. I had to write a, something for Dr. Rabani. I didn't have a clue how to get started. I had asked ChatGPT. It came back with with kind of a not an acceptable response in terms of submitting it to him because he would know it immediately. But that te- that gave me a way of organizing things and a way of getting started. I think that's very valuable. I, but to me, the, the big challenge here is to teach students how to use it if they are going to use it, that they can so they use it effectively. Um, and I don't think that's as obvious as we might think. I think it takes there is a learning curve that you have to climb in order to get really effective use. So how do we as faculty do that? Well, for one, I think it's uh, valuable to encourage students to kind of embrace it and, and try it out. But, you know, look at it very cautiously and understand that uh, they do need to fact check everything. So they're going to get an immediate response. They're having this interaction, but they have to kind of draw from their classroom experience, their lab experience, what we teach them, what they learn from the textbook or the lab or the research project and actually verify validity of the information because they're likely going to go to medical school or graduate school or industry positions where they're probably going to utilize this technology as many companies have. And it's not going to be acceptable just to turn in something that's copy and pasted from ChatGPT. They're going to be expected to be that expert who can validate the information. So it's great if we can teach them how to save time and make sure that information is accurate. Um. And one of the things with this course is that it's a low-stakes learning environment. So it's not a high-stakes learning environment. It's not a thesis course. It's one essay out of five essays, and they can make it up if they screw up. And so learning how to use it effectively, which, you know, I'm learning uh, perhaps how to provide guidance, and they're learning how to use it more effectively in a low-stakes environment is one of the things that I think the university can provide, and hopefully this course is an example of providing that. All right. Uh, I want to open up the floor to questions. Anything, any questions on involving teaching or learning? Gerda has a question. Uh Hi. I find... What David is doing something that it should be done probably from by the university library and all students in some sense must be trained in this. I think this is wonderful. I have a question. Have you thought why the outcomes, the way different students respond are the way they are? In a sense that is it possible that the students who actually do the writing are the one who already have critical thinking, good language skill, research skill, and they know how to follow. And going back to the question about cheating, students learn this skill when they're doing by themselves bootstrapping, lots of this. And so if they always have something to start them on and give them the scaffold, are we really not training students the right way? They only need somebody to support them. David, would you care to take that on? Well, in thermodynamics, the systems tend to go to the lowest energy level possible. <laughs> and so uh, one of the things we as faculty have to do is create an excitation so that we move out of the lowest energy level possible. So we. We have that challenge as faculty members. Uh, and certain students have that, and certain students will try to look just as in a programming class, there'll be students who embrace it and students who don't in, in engineering. So um, I tested the chat on a thermodynamics problem because I thought, oh, since Chegg, uh, now a Chegg story, which is since we have time. So Chegg's story is I used to, oh, I know, it was during COVID. And I was wondering why I did this. But anyway, they would do tests online and they'd have the test. And then Chegg, they'd send a question to Chegg. It would give them the answer in 20 minutes and that would be their response because they didn't want to learn. It was easier to do that than learn the material. And so what I did is I joined Chegg too so I could get the response. And so uh, that... 
and then I knew if they copied it exactly, it became fairly easy. Uh, what I found with uh, chat was that it did thermodynamics problems incorrectly. Now, I only did a case of one. So I know for scientists in the crowd that that is not a good model, but it was good enough for me. I can, I can guarantee that ChatGPT does not know how to design circuits. Definitely, that has been confirmed. Okay. Uh, and, actually, and so when we get into a qualitative discussion of writing, it would seem to me that that's something where, where we're having this challenge. I actually want to get into that. So technical writing has been very important for uh, scientists and engineers for a long time because, you know, you might have brilliant ideas, but if you cannot communicate them, they're functionally useless. And so that's one of the reasons why we have, you know, essays and things like that. But now that we have these tools that basically can do the language smithing for you, is it still important for engineering students to learn how to write technically if you can just rely on those skills? Yeah, yes, it's very important because writing is a manifestation of your thought process. And if you can't write well, you probably don't think that coherently or, or that well. So I think writing is very important. But I also think we have to encourage students rather than saying, well, you, some of them are going to take advantage of this and some of them are not. We need to create an environment which encourages them to do that. And then understand that they will use it in different ways for different purposes, but at least they'll be exposed to it. So I think it's very important. But writing is writing. If you can't write well, if you, if you, especially if you're going to publish things, that you, obviously if you're not writing well, it probably means you don't really understand what you're writing about. And that means you haven't thought this through. And we don't need more people generating more things that are not well thought out. Uh, we need the inverse, obviously. So I, w I would be in favor of encouraging them. And also not discouraging them. If, if they write something uh, and you think it's largely chat, then, then say, okay, well, revisit this or explain it to me. Um, or have them get up in front of the class and talk about it and s stimulate some interest in it. I think the, best, the most valuable pedagogical part of it right now is the fact that if, if, you're, if students are reading a textbook and they have a question about something and it's not covered adequately in the textbook, chat GPT can probably give them some insight and save them a lot of time. Um, also, if they don't know how to start something, it, it does give you uh, points of departure. It is true that it's like uh, Google search in one respect. You, you start off looking for something on uh, about cells, uh, and after the fifth or sixth reference, suddenly you're talking about jet aircraft, and then you're talking about elephants in Africa. Um, it, ChatGPT has a tendency to do that too. The more, you, the more you demand of it, the more you realize that there's not a great deal of depth of knowledge in everything that it, it responds to. So I'm very much in favor of it. I just think it has to be used in caution. I think this fear of it is kind of nonsensical. Um, we could have made the same arguments about the microprocessor when it became available in 1975. Look at the impact it's had. Look at the negative impact that it's had. We've learned to deal with that. Uh, we haven't found it necessary to legislate the use of the Internet. Uh, I don't think we need to legislate the use of ChatGPT uh, or the technology. And I think we need to get out of the way and let it happen. And I think we should expose the students to it in the way that Dr. Burkhardt has been doing and in other ways. Um, and view it as a, as a process, an iterative process that over time will produce positive results for the students and for the world. Dr. Norman? I think uh, ChatGPT in a lot of ways is like a calculator. It's just a tool that many of us will embrace and use effectively. So it's important as educators to teach our students the fundamentals, in which case would be math, how to add numbers. But when they go on into the workplace, we don't expect them to do everything by hand. We expect them to utilize the tools they have access to, like the calculator, and be able to check their work and make sure the calculator is giving them some answer that makes sense. So it's it's a valuable tool if you knew how to use it uh, effectively. Actually, this is a great segue talking about calculators to a question I have, which is, um, and there's a lot of panic going on in the world of academia about how do we deal with students being able to copy and paste essays. Um, whereas in a sense, we have engineers have gone through this kind of educational upheaval before. Um, we, a lot of us, we, we work in the realm of mathematics and, you know, in 2009, Wolfram Alpha was released, which has the ability to perform symbolic math. Uh, and then even before that, in the 1970s and eighties, when the graphing calculator became quite prominent, all of a sudden students could do arithmetic quite easily without having to do it by hand. Um, so we as engineers have kind of faced this, oh my gosh, the students can just copy everything and get the solution. So 
as people have lived through that as students or as educators, uh, do you have any advice for, you know, the non-STEM fields about how to handle a disruptive technology like this? Yeah. Expose it to them and encourage them to use it and then try to, try to make it a positive experience. I don't think any, there's any reason not to use it that in terms of if you if you want to write a paper on. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. I asked ChatGPT recently about um, the expression in the best of all possible worlds. What did that mean? And it came back and said, well, you know, you want to live in a good world and things should be positive and we'd be joyful for everyone and blah, blah, blah. And then it went on to say, oh, by the way, uh, Candide was, was written by Leibniz. Um, and it wasn't written by Leibniz, it was written by Voltaire, and it was a parody of Leibniz. So it got everything messed up. It didn't realize it was a parody, it didn't know who the author was, it didn't even, it didn't immediately seize on the fact that it's a recurrent, much uh, often repeated phrase in, in Candide itself. So that's why I say you have to be very careful about what it appears to be a very definitive statement about something that ChatGPT came up with. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you, after a while, you learn to view the output with a jaundiced eye and you say, OK, there's things it's great at and things it's not great at. It's true that if I had a four function, four function calculator that could add, subtract, multiply and divide. And occasionally when I added two numbers together, it got the wrong answer. I would be very frustrated by that. But eventually I would learn how to deal, deal with that. And over time, these things will get refined and we, we will learn as all things that uh, they find their proper place. My example, classic example, is when the diesel engine came out, everybody was told it was going to replace all forms of internal combustion engine. Yet when I went out to mow my grass, I didn't have a diesel engine on my, on my lawnmower. Uh, it found its place, and ChatGPT will do the same. So I think we should encourage students. I don't think we should be negative about ChatGPT. I do think we should exercise caution or have them exercise caution and encourage them to use it and critique the results that they get. So I guess one of my questions, because Eddie, what I'm doing is it's like jumping off the pier and not knowing how to swim. And so hopefully from my experience, in the, because I'll ask the students, because we want them to become knowledgeable users of this, but how do I create an, an, an environment where I can help them become not knowledgeable users? And that's the challenge. And that's the challenge I have. That, that's the challenge that they have in terms of becoming knowledgeable users. And then after I will ask them, we've done one iteration. So thus far, the class you know, divided into quarters. So thus far, we've done one iteration. Now we're going to do the second iteration. By the time we get, and there are going to be five iterations. And so, or five times they write something and present. So one of the ways I can tell, because people alluded to this before, is that they have to present what they learned. Now, I can tell, <laughs> I don't read the paper until after I see the presentation, so I can tell whether they know something based on the presentation, because uh, if it's superficial, because a lot of times there are generalities that have been created, uh, then I know that I have to look deeper. So part of it is our learning with each other. So I view this as a mutual learning environment. Obviously, I have to assess it, so it's not, they'll assess me at the end of the semester, but that's a different issue. Um, it doesn't have the same gravitas. Um, and so, but I, hopefully, there, I'm sure there are other faculty at Hofstra who are, are embracing this where students need to use it. And, and then how do they refine it so it becomes theirs, just as we had with papers. And so it could be that, I don't know who they are. <clears throat> So I'm one. There could be others. Are there others who are using it to write papers, modest papers? Uh, and we could get together and assess strategies. And from that might evolve a strategy that we could tell the university, perhaps in a forum like this or something like that, as to what was effective, what's not effective, and what we don't know. You have other thoughts? I was just going to say, I think a lot of it also has to do with just trial and error and learning from the opportunities from the different exercises that you might do. You know, for non-STEM fields, you know, technology is in everywhere. Like over 50% of jobs that require technology are non-technical jobs. You know, anywhere from nursing all the way through just working at, like, you know, a Starbucks. They're all dealing with some form of technology. 
So I think really just trial and error and embracing the change and going incrementally. You know, it doesn't have to be, be like rip the bandaid off and change it overnight. You can really just try it and adjust as you go. And you take the output of the learnings and change it and see how the new learnings will be based on a new cycle. Excellent. So trying to think about maybe the more positive aspects of how we can use this. So, um, well, given the aims of the education address this fall, uh, our colleague, Dr. Segal, used AI-generated images to help visualize the different possible outcomes of a design project. So here's this design project we're going to do. What does this look like? And then showing, you know, visual images of what this, you know, to inspire the students. So how else do you think we can use generi uh, generative AI to enhance the learning experience and through, from a motivation standpoint? How can we use it to make teaching and learning more engaging? Any thoughts? I think it's a great tool for um, creating illustrative examples of things. For example, it'll write Python programs, the modest ones, um, it, and others. It, it knows a number of languages, or at least it's conversant with a number of languages. It, so if a student has in CS, for example, has a question about how to write something or how to how to get started, um, they can go to GPT and sort of describe what they want to do. I think it's great. If, as I said, if you're if you're if you're studying and you can't you can't get clarity on some concept, it very often does provide you with some information that, in a pretty efficient manner. Uh, it does suffer from this fact that the that it. Sometimes depth is an issue. If you want to go deeply into a subject, it has problems. Um, but I think rather than concentrating on the, the fears, there was a presentation here yesterday where it was suggested that uh, AI was going to shift the power struggle in the world, and uh, we better adopt European models immediately and start regulating everything, or we're going to be in big trouble. I don't think that kind of perspective is helpful at all. We could have. That's not the idea. The idea is. This is a very valuable technology. It's in an interim state. It's not going to stay where it is. Transformers are not going to be the way of the future, as far as we can tell. The people are already talking about moving well beyond that. Uh, the Chomskys of the world are going to continue to insist that we understand uh, human cognition uh, and be able to model that and maybe move to symbolic models of things as opposed to uh, the kind of technology that's used in uh the current AI technology. So I think it's a very exciting field, it's a, and it's a reality. This is where the world is going to go. So we have to get in front of this, make students not fear it, try to find different ways to encourage them to use it, as in the case of what you're doing here. Um, and I think it will be a very positive benefit. I think to indulge myself in answering. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, come on. Uh, I was um, just wondering, um, you were talking about other fields and how AI has already made its way into other fields. And so, for example, like the recent w WGA strikes, it recently ended because the writers were able to come to terms, and one of the terms was about regulating AI, and their fears for regulating AI was that, you know, right now, obviously, it's in a very uh, infant state, AI, and its databases can get things wrong, but their fear was eventually it will get to a point where the data spaces will get more accurate, and as a result, the ideas that the AI constructs will be more original, and they may get to a point where they are able to cohesively make up uh, ideas and, for example, scripts or whatever that are able to replace and maybe surpass limits of humanity. And it's the same thing with the art community. There is a big outcry of AI-generated art and how it's scarily getting more accurate as the data gets more accurate, and it's drawing from real artists. And so to apply that to the computer science field, maybe one day uh, with the database getting more accurate, it could be able to construct its own original code that surpasses that of uh, computer scientists. So do you think uh, that the computer science field or any other field should follow the steps of the WGA and ask for more regulations due to that fear? Well, I've already said I'm very opposed to that. First of all, I, I, a, lot of, a lot of the responses that you're reading or seeing on YouTube and stuff are, are people who uh, are advocates of uh, science fiction. So, so they we have a lot, many, many years of, of uh, science fiction community talking about robotics and uh, 
and intelligence in various forms and so forth. I don't see that as something to be afraid of, certainly not for the time being. And remember, the, the problem we have right now is that GPT does not understand anything about context. And if you do try to describe it, the context to it, it still doesn't really, it doesn't really understand anything in terms of, of having any understanding of things. What it does is it uses statistical technique to try to figure out, well, on average, what word would normally occur after this word. So it doesn't have any fundamental understanding. Uh, and also, it doesn't have any primitives. I mean, you yourself have within your mind, right, within your brain, a certain set of primitives that you rely on to understand things. And that's what allows you to, to uh, engage in abstract analysis of things, for example, that you have, you can abstract things beyond just semantics. And um, so I don't see that as, to me personally, I don't see that as a, as a big problem. But I think it's a way to get attention. I think it's a way to get on YouTube. It's a way to get interviewed. It's a way to raise money. It's a way to... to uh, Talks about things that are exciting, get people focused on what you have to say. I don't see this as being a problem right now. And I think you could make exactly the same argument about microcomputers. You could, you could have said the same thing. It's going to change the world. We're going to put microcomputers into all kinds of military weapons, and, and we're going to facilitate the generation of or the propagation of bad information, and the Internet is, it was not a good idea. I think you can make all those arguments. It turns out we've come to terms with those things, and we'll come to terms with, with chat GPT. Someone, someone else have any thoughts? Well, I mean, one thing that comes to mind about legislation is just to protect individuals using it. As you see, Jet, Jet GPT warn its users that it's not a medical doctor, right? So it's prudent to warn users not to just do some medical treatment that they read on the internet or fall like as we learned, you know, from today, like do some legal case work based on something from Jet GPT. So I would say. We might want to regulate it to the extent that it protects individuals, um, but I, you know, I'm not a big fan of like really. Yeah, the problem with that is regulation. who decides what's protection, and the idea of turning this over to the government is frightening. <laughs> they can't even run the post office. Uh, Anyways, we want so moving right. on. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> moving on. So uh, that was actually a perfect question to segue. Thank you. Um, I'll give you a tip later. So we're going to move into professional practice now. So uh, a sort of similar question is that um, Forrester's Financial recently predicted that 48% of engineering occupations would be impacted by generative AI. So impact doesn't mean we're going to be replaced. It just means that our jobs are going to be substantially altered. So do you think that's a reasonable estimate? And how do you see that impacting engineers? How do you see it changing the job of an engineer? Should make it a lot more interesting for instance. You'll be able to do things you couldn't do before much easier. And jobs always change. In my lifetime, which has been a fair amount of time, uh, things have changed dramatically. And uh, the way we, when I was in school, we used slide rules. And as my father pointed out, one of the virtues of slide rules is you never had to replace the batteries. But the world has moved on. And I've learned how to use new calculating technology. And I'm able to do things with much greater facility. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think worrying about that is, to me, would not be an issue. I, I do own slide rules because I'm into that stuff. Anyways, Dr. Bergali, do you have any thoughts? I was going to say that I, I really wouldn't worry about it all too much. I think a lot of it comes from, you know, engineers have to be creative, have to think outside the box. So I think, you know, maybe helping with calculations and, you know, doing models. But still, the engineer has the responsibility of checking the output to make sure that it's valid and, you know, correct. So, you know, to Eddie's point, it might facilitate getting work done. But I don't think it, you know, abdicates their responsibility of, you know, making sure that the output is correct and that is, you know, valid based on the inputs. I think I didn't want to. Go ahead. Um, you already did. I already did. I screwed up. <laughs> um, I'm not. Part of it is I don't truly really know what all the engineers do. I know about academia. I really don't know about the business world of engineering. Uh, and most of the academics, except for the person to my right. Uh, I know I did it again. Um, but I would, I would think that it would foster more, cre the potential to foster more creativity. I think what um, you had said about engineers being responsible at the end is very important. So I, I think... Maybe 48% will be affected by it. Well, how it's affected, I don't know. And, you know, how it would be used. 
you have any thoughts, Dr. Marno? I mean, one way to think about it is it's kind of analogous just to the internet. The internet has allowed us to connect very effectively to a wealth of information that we previously weren't exposed to. Um, this is just kind of a fancy way, you know, that it arranges the words like you're talking to a person and learning new things. So ultimately, it's just a way to learn more very efficiently and effectively. And I think like the internet, we will adopt it and learn how to use it effectively. And it probably will be a very valuable tool to engineers and other disciplines. And is this under professional practice? Yeah. Oh, well, as a professional, I'm a professor. And so in terms of what I was thinking about here, uh, one, there's a challenge that uh, GPT-4 costs money, so it isn't free for students. It would be good if there were a way for that to be the case, so there is some financial restriction that way, I was told. I, uh, I think what I found with, um, I teach children's engineering to elementary school teachers. So, uh, and so we're moving more towards things that students will do on Chromebooks, et cetera, and more things. So I think maybe perhaps in this course, which I hadn't thought about until now, I'd use more multimedia. So with ChatGPT, there's Dolly, they're bringing in movies. There's, there's things that they can do that I can change the environment of what the output is. So right now the output is a 750 word essay. What if I change that? So the essay is there, but it's enhanced by media. And so I think, and this has the, so from my perspective as a professor, I need to think about this. I'll ask students who know more about it than me anyway, and not because they use this. Is this something they would find exciting? Because I need something that's the hook to make them go further. And if this becomes a hook that makes them go further to create more of a multimedia presentation and research, then that's perhaps something I should do. Not giving up the essay and not all that, but I, I think I have to, as a professional in education, begin to think about that. Great. So engineering is a profession built on trust. Um, for example, we all trust that a bridge will not collapse when we drive on top of it. Uh, is it possible to use generative AI as engineers and still maintain that trust? It's a black box, and we don't know how it operates. So can we maintain that trust while using it? Um, I don't think it's really, uh, I don't know about building bridges. I doubt if it knows anything about building a bridge, but I don't know that for a fact. It, as far as sophisticated designs, there, there are a lot of existing sophisticated design tools. I don't see, see chat GPT replacing those tools. Uh, it might be in some introductory level of interest, um, but I don't see it as a, as a sophisticated design tool. It doesn't have the depth and you don't, you don't, the stuff it's been exposed to so far is not, not heavily weighted by that kind of uh, data as far as its training is concerned. So I wouldn't think it would be terribly effective at that. Well, you can imagine it starts doing things. It's very effective for writing, and as a civil engineer, you have to do a lot of paperwork, a lot of documents to make sure that things are approved and sort of document your work, and that's a lot of labor that you can imagine ChatGPT could accelerate by allowing those documents to be processed faster, which you can see would be a huge benefit to a lot of practicing civil engineers. But by doing that, are you eroding that trust that the public has that we our work is professional? Do you have any thoughts, Dr. Kelly? Um, I don't think it changes the responsibility because at the end of the day, the engineer still has to make sure the outputs are correct. So, like, you know, whether you rely on a computer program or if you do calculations by hand, you know, just because you get something from ChatGTP or other software, you can't just take it on, you know, faith that it, it's good. You have to do some due diligence to make sure the outputs are, are correct. So, okay, so do you think that there are general ethical guidelines that you'd recommend for professionals using AI? Like, um, The only guideline that I can recall in general is the National Society of Professional Engineers. They have their, you know, for licensed engineers, they have their professional ethical guidelines. And I don't believe that they, it touches on AI at this point, but I think that there should be some ethical consideration, some considerations when it comes to that. Okay. Um, so one thing you brought up earlier um, I think Eddie brought it up, was that engineers rely on computational tools all the time. Um, we use computer-aided design and simulation. I use a lot of finite element simulation. 
Um, and they're pretty central to modern engineering in general. Um, so we're not literally sitting there calculating everything on the slide rule. Um, so the question is, uh, how is generative AI different? What makes generative AI different than relying on SolidWorks to accurately calculate the um, force on a load? I would say that a lot of the software has a track record. Right now, ChatGPT and other AI, generative AI is still in its infancy. And, you know, even just doing simple literature reviews or keyword searches, you're getting a lot of, you know, made up references and such. So, you know, based on, but versus other software like Microsoft Excel, you know, PowerPoint, you know, SolidWorks, they're proven technology, they're proven, you know, software and tools engineers use. So I think there's a lot more heavy reliance and a better proven track record. Yeah, that, that like with SolidWorks, you know exactly how, the input is processed, so you have confidence over its track record that it works, so we can rely on it. But with ChatGPT, we don't really know what's going on under the hood. It's like a mm -hmm. black box. So we have no way to scrutinize it and how it evaluates input and gives us an output. All we can do is just look at the output and determine if it's valid. It would be nice if we had more access to the way it's processing this information. Yeah, ChatGPT is not, is not uh, a sophisticated computational tool in terms of doing mathematical computations in any event. And that's evidenced in part by the fact that Mathematica has been interfaced to it. So there's nobody that thinks that uh, chat GPT in and of itself is, is sophisticated enough to do complex uh, calculations. And in fact, if you ask it how to, how to perform a complex integral, very often it will come back and tell you, well, I can tell you how to go about it. And once in a while, if it's something they found in, found in an example somewhere, it will cite the results of the example. So I don't think it, I don't think that's. I think you have to be aware of, of universal tools. You know, it's a combination of screwdriver, pliers, wire cutters, car jack, welding tool, pneumatic system. Uh, it turns out they don't do things like that. Generally, don't do a very good job. It would, and the nice thing about SolidWorks is it has a very targeted. Uh, it's a very targeted design tool. It's been very rigorously tested. It's used by millions of people and has been for a long time. And it's very specific. It does certain things very well. Other things it doesn't do at all. It's not a generic tool. So I, th I think the CAD tools in general will always be with us. Um, and so will Mathematica and other specialized tools. And that's not really the role for ChatGPT. We have to get away from this idea, I think, of thinking that it's going to replace all forms of human cognition. I don't see that happening, certainly not within the next hundred years. And I don't think that there's anybody among the, the AI community of any stature that seriously believes that either. I think they, they recognize that this is a tool that's useful for certain things. And we as a community have to figure out how to use it most effectively. And we have to encourage our students to use it effectively. And one of the things that we need, some disciplines will need to focus on is to teach students how to pose the problem or their prompt that, th that they want to get a response to. Uh, because ChatGPT is not going to come back and say, well, you didn't ask me about this. Or what's the value of that? Um, so I think it's a tool that we have to learn how to use. And right now, we don't know how to use it most effectively, but we're learning. And we have to encourage the students to do the same thing. And I think if you ask them to write a report, they do it on ChatGPT. Okay, that's a starting point. Challenge them. Say, go back and redo this. You've got a good start on this. Now go back and make it yours. Okay. Uh, and gives them a, a basis for getting started. But I don't think it's, if anything, we should be encouraging it, not discouraging it. And stop worrying about the future. You can't control the future anyway. And we have to deal with what we're dealing with right now. So that, that's my view. So I want to ask about uh, maybe a gray area in the computational algorithm space. This is an engineering panel after all. Um, so we have these tools like SolidWorks, which have explicitly known formulas that we can say, okay, it's doing a finite element simulation. We know how that works. And on the other extreme, we have generative AI. But we've also had AI adjacent tools for a while, like reinforced learning and metaheuristic optimization algorithms. For people who don't know, metaheuristic basically means it's an optimization algorithm that doesn't understand the problem it's working on. It just optimizes given an input and allow it to twiddle, twiddle some, twiddle the inputs and get the output and maximize it. So even though we've had these tools, there hasn't been the same kind of, and they're being used in engineering, there hasn't been the same kind of uh, freak out, you might say. We didn't have, I mean, I don't know this, but I don't think there was a presidential symposium on reinforced learning at Hofstra. So what is it about the generative AI in particular is different than other AI tools that have been in the development in the last 15 years? 
Well, so first of all, a lot of those were rules-based. They weren't statistically statistical systems. Uh, that's one thing. Um, all the expert systems, for example. Although, interesting case, the, the Price Waterhouse back in the 80s spent about $20 million getting all excited about AI, and they sent a group of, of uh, their staff down to Louisiana to follow a guy around who was responsible for controlling the levees and the dams in Louisiana. And the idea was that he was getting older and they were going to replace him with, a, with an expert system. And they discovered that uh, after they spent some time with him that he was making decisions that he didn't even understand. He couldn't explain. But it turned out, statistically, he was doing the right thing on average. And they gave up because they didn't understand the process. And what you're dealing with in the chat bot technology has very little to do with other than the alleged claim that it's a, it's a neural network, uh, which it is not. Uh, it, it's similar. It has some similarities there, but it's not a neural network. It certainly doesn't. If you read uh, people like Jeff Hawkins' work, where he talks about the neocortex and the fact that there's, there are stacks of neurons working in conjunction to provide certain primitive capability and so forth. It's a far cry from, from what the human uh, brain does. And then you get to consciousness. If you don't have consciousness, you don't have awareness. If you don't have awareness, why would I want to rely, put my life uh, based on something where the, its specialty is figuring out what the next word should be based on some statistical uh, computation that it does? And I don't even know what the training set had in it, so I don't know the quality of it. So does that mean it's not valuable? It's very valuable, but we have to learn how to use it. And that's going to take time. And I think right now, on average, we, we are in very early days. I think all of us would probably agree that we're having to learn how to use this thing and when not to use it. And there are times when you don't want to use it for certain things. So, But we should embrace it, not fear it. All right. So one of the things that we have found is that um, there's a preprint study from Purdue that came out that found that ChatGPT incorrectly answered 52% of programming questions from Stack Overflow. Um, however, uh, and that, however, when users were reading these responses, um, they failed to identify the incorrect information 39% of the time. So what that means is 52% of the time chat GPT answered incorrectly, and then 39% of the time users reading it preferred the incorrect answer written by chat GPT. And so given the importance of accuracy in engineering, you know, how can we how can we uh, mitigate the tendency of AI to create, to confidently create inaccurate answers that humans then internalize and be like, well, this is confident, so I should believe it. Uh, how do we design systems to avoid, uh, to mitigate that user error, so to say? Focus on curating the, the uh, training set is the, is the first thing you want to do. And secondly, make sure engineers understand where this tool is to be used and where it is not to be used. If it's there for, if you want to use it for inspiration, it's a wonderful tool. But if you want to use it to build a bridge, I wouldn't drive over any bridge that ChatGPT thought was safe. Uh, and I don't think anybody else would either. So you just have to learn how to use it. And are there any the user interaction is really important. So when they, an expert in the field reads a you know, answer from ChatGPT, they can confirm if that is accurate or inaccurate. So I think it's important for humans to be very involved in that loop to help better train the model using something like a, a curated data set, which I agree with. It seems to me, since I, I'm not doing this, uh, that I wouldn't trust it to do calculations. So the calculations-based information that you're going to do with PSPICE or whatever you're going, CAD, whatever, I would not rely on this. Everything that it seems to be doing is more, let's say, qualitative in terms of writing as opposed to quantitative in terms of solving an equation. And so I, th I think the part of work life where that's involved, then it can be of assist. To have it solve a thermodynamics problem, now my question was only one, but it was a simple one and it did it wrong. And it took three pages to explain why it did it wrong. So <laughs> So I want to open it up. We have about 10 minutes left. So questions on this or questions on anything else, um, please come up to the mic and we can address them. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, 
I mean, this whole symposium was extremely interesting, and I was listening to the panel of the nursing school, and something really scared me. I would like to listen your, hear your opinion. Barbara Messina, who is the chair of undergraduate nursing, said that they're being asked and told to use generative AI tools and this is without oversight. And these systems basically decide on treatment. And this is why they're now going into talking about augmented AI. So it really scares me, not that much from the engineering and computing community, how AI is used, but how these ideas get market pressures, and different disciplines, people are using them, trusting them. So do we have some responsibility there I think as this, people creating the tools? I think this came up during your session uh, number one, where your group had talked about how um, some people use ChatGPT in a way where it's not regulated and it connects directly to something that's sensitive and it's controlling things without human intervention. So I think that's dangerous because if it's something that's really important, it might make a wrong decision and cause a lot of damage and do something really bad. So I think it's important to have that very close human oversight during how, these early But stages. how do you account for the fact that we don't have that kind of regulation on the internet? If that's so important, why don't we worry well, about that? But you're not gonna kill someone because it's- Well, it's, you might. The remember, the information in ChatGPT came from the internet. Yeah, but there's a difference where with the internet isn't actively making decisions in a loop for um, people, whereas in this case you no, have the data that. is there, and sure, which is based, which is what ChatGPT bases its sure. But there's on. a there's a categorical difference between the information being available and putting a system to make decisions using that information. And so, how do we protect against? No, that? I asked ChatGPT. I said I took eight aspirins and thirteen Advil. I don't that... feel very well. What should I do? <laughs> and ChatGPT said, "Well, you should you should call nine one one." And I, I said, "Well, could you call nine one one?" And it said, "No." And I said, "Well, am I going to die?" And it said, "Well, just call Chat, just call nine one one." So the, the, there are limitations right now on the kind of medical advice it will give you, but you can get the same information off the no, internet. It, it, There's no, seems... it's not adding value by by summarizing what it found on the internet seems what Gerda said was that there was not going to be a filter. It was, it was going to be the part of the control system. Yeah, I don't Which know. Is that's, bad. That's, like the, that's like the physician's desk reference. The physician's desk reference was used for years for doctors to look into and find out contraindications for various drugs. And it turned out, somebody pointed out, all the information in here was, was contributed by the, the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. And yet, life went on. I, I just fear this regulation business. I don't think we want to allow anything to happen that will injure anybody, but uh, I think for trying to regulate it could be a two-edged sword. So I've been thinking about something since you, um, Professor Curry, responded to this student's question about the um, writer's strike and the settlement. Yes. And it kind of relates to this. I just want to try this out. So, you, you know, he, I think he was asking the question, um, you know, was it, were, were they right to go on strike to worry about AI sort of taking over their jobs at some level? And I think your response was, we ought to just sort of live and let live and let this thing kind of happen and see, you know, how things turn out. But there's a very big difference between, um, and this was the example I heard on the radio uh, this morning or yesterday morning, you know, feeding um, five scripts of Nora Ephron's into in movie scripts, uh, and she wrote things like uh, "You've Got Mail" and that sort of thing. Feeding them into Chat GPT or some other AI, and having it come out with a very Nora Ephron type of script that you could then um, produce as a movie, right? Without giving Nora Ephron, who of course has passed away, but if she were alive or, or her estate, any kind of um, uh, royalties for that. Um, it, it all came from Nora Ephron, but this thing that came out was not. That seems to me to be a very different thing 
to think about regulating, and in this case, it's been sort of regulated through a union contract now, or will be, um, than to say, you know, if you get an answer out of chat GPT, because you say, how should I build a bridge or um, uh, and some other question that you should look at that skeptically, which of course I completely agree with. Those are two very different things. And so I don't think, I, I think actually that the, the criticism of chat GPT, which is, uh, it doesn't have context, right? I think it can almost, the same thing can be said for us. That we can't say, oh, let's live and let live with chat GPT unless you have the context. So in the context of should it, should we ask it how to build a bridge and then just take whatever it says and go build a bridge? Which I think the answer is no. But if the question is, should we feed a bunch of um, creative thought into it and then take something out of it that is sort of a, it's not really the person's creative thought because it was sort of manipulated in some way and came back out. I think the answer is yes, we have to regulate that. And so I think we too have to think about chat GPT in context. We can't make rules that say, let's just sort of see how it goes, um, because it's quite different. And I've learned this sitting in here for three days, um, that it, it has so many different kinds of contextual uses um, that our regulation of it is going to have to also be very contextual. But that's not, a, that's, that's not saying no regulation. It's saying, let's think about this in, always in context, just as we're demanding, we're saying that's the problem with ChatGPT. So that's what was rolling around in my head after this young man's question, um, and I think it applies to um, what also what we were what we were just talking about. Do you all mind if I respond to that? Sorry, I, I don't. Mind. Okay, so I think it's a very good point, and I think there's a really big important difference for us as engineering is the context of engineering is in a lot of ways easy, because I think everyone here says, "Oh, I I use ChatGPT to design this ceiling that's above you. And I think everyone here would say, I'm leaving this room immediately because everyone knows that with engineering, a lot of the times we do our work poorly and people die. Um, so that's easy. It's like an easy ethical question for us. It's just no, obviously. For other industries like creative industries, right? No one's going to die if that movie's made, right? It's much more of a different type of question. You know, it's a more complex question of how to navigate that, right? It does have a huge impact. But it's not so obvious to everyone. So I, I agree. It's There's different context matters. And so for us, looking at our context, a lot of times it's just more clear cut. And that's an advantage we have that other fields don't. Yeah, and I guess what I was concerned about with the answer to this question was that um, it, it nobody will die if you create a Nora Ephron movie. But, but it will be a movie that somebody else didn't get paid for creating, that people are going to a movie and that some corporation that did that is getting all the benefit of that when actually, and not having to pay any royalties, not having to acknowledge any creativity of anybody else. So I guess I, the context I'm saying is that I don't think any of us in any field can actually um, have a, an opinion, I mean, always have an opinion, but have a, a persuasive opinion about things in other fields, it, as far as AI is chat, AI goes because we may, act, may not actually understand the complexities below it. As you say, in engineering, it, it is pretty easy for most people to understand. In other, in other contexts, maybe not. Can I respond to what you said? Yeah. May I respond? Um, I think you make a very interesting point. Um, this, for me, the first question I would ask is, is the strike was really occasioned by their concern for chatbot you know that for a fact? It was one of the two or was that an allegation? Or was that it was one of the two biggest ones. Now, I understand it was this part the part of the discussion, but I'm talking about intent. And we don't know intent. All we know is what they what they said. Um, you as a lawyer well, as a, as a lawyer, you, as a lawyer can, you know that yes. proving intent is very difficult. It's very difficult, but right. they were they expressed that this was their intent, and that is good enough in a court. Well, of law. that's like Cicero was once asked what gods he prayed to, and he said publicly all, privately none. I, I don't know what to make of that. I'm not denying that that could be the case. I don't know. I, I do, but know. I also don't believe that ChatGPT right now certainly is capable of writing something that that would be strongly competitive with a professional writer. That's very hard to believe. It's based on, based on the things that I've seen it write. We don't know how it's going to evolve. 
And the other thing is maybe maybe we do want to protect them and maybe we have to find our way through that. Uh, my objection is to look, is in general trying to regulate ChatGPT. If there's public safety involved, if it's a matter of jeopardizing people's jobs, that's a societal decision that has to be made as to whether or not we're going to protect them. But just to unilaterally decide that we're not going to allow ChatGPT to do anything that interferes with anybody's vocation, I think is too broad. Uh, because the world has to evolve, and through of, through of hold on, it's true of engineering as well. I think we have to, we're going to have to evolve, uh, and we are evolving. For example, it used to be that if you didn't know integral calculus, you couldn't function very well. It turns out now, if you can take a Laplace transform and you know how to look up the integrals that you need and the the uh, anti integral the do the reverse process, your engineering reduces to solving a bunch of algebraic equations. So what is our problem now? We have students who come here that are not very good in algebra. So the focus has to change as time goes on. So so I yield to your point, but I'm afraid that if this thing gets out of control, it could be it could be adverse to the interest of all of us. And I'm not I'm not a big I'm not a big believer in government knows best. I'm not a big believer in regulating things is really always and the best. Eddie, I think, this is I think we're we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, those are very important political questions to be decided, and I think it's definitely very important, but I think we're running out of time, and so I want to thank everybody for your time. Thank you for your great questions, and I hope you have a lovely rest of the symposium.